Hey everyone, it's Bree here at Blossman Branch, and today we're going to be talking about soil health, soil testing, amendments, fertilizers, all those juicy things you want to know heading into spring. Let's go. This video is one that I really wanted to get out because I think it's so important, and I think that most of you who tune into my channel are as passionate about soil health as I am. Every time I talk about, you know, that I'm geeking out on soil, most of you seem pretty into it. So let's geek out on soil together. And just for the background, I have done hundreds of garden consults over the years, so I've seen a lot of things. And a lot of that combined with my own experience is where I get kind of these overall themes that I see in gardening. And one of the questions that I've gotten a lot in the past has been about soils testing. Is it worth doing? Should I get a soils test? Uh, when should I get a soils test? What kind of soils test? All of these questions. So I'm gonna hit that first. First of all, when do you need a soils test? Well, you can get one anytime. Um, there are a few guidelines, I would say. If you're going to do repeat soils testing, say you're trying to really improve your soil, you're doing it aggressively, you wanna kinda of keep tabs on what's happening every year, just make sure you're doing it at the same time of year. So if you're always soils testing in spring, always soils test in spring, because the numbers can look quite different between spring and fall. If you start soils testing in the fall, just make sure that every time you do a checkup that you do it at the same time of year. That way you can kind of really get a better idea of trends happening in your soil. In terms of when you should soils test as a general rule, I always like to do a soils test when I'm establishing a new bed, a new space in the garden, or if I've moved to a new location. Um, just kind of getting a baseline for what's happening in the soil is always a good idea. And I say that because what can often happen is that we over amend. So this is just a general trend in home gardening is that we tend to put too much stuff into and onto our soil. Big ag often gets blamed for this. And while it is true that big ag uses a lot of unnecessary fertilizers, so do home gardeners. In fact, home gardeners typically use a higher rate per square foot by far of things like herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers than agriculture does. As an overall rule, we just amend too much and it's usually not necessary. This is why I usually like to get a soils test when I'm first starting out of space so that I can really know, okay, what am I dealing with here? Does it really need a lot of work? Or can I just do some small tweaks to make my garden plantable? I also like to know, so if you're moving to a new space, if you're planning on planting, around your house area, if your house has been painted and you've noticed any paint chips in the soil, then I would recommend getting a lead test. Getting a test for lead, arsenic, heavy metals can be a good idea, especially if you're gardening in a space where you're not sure what the history is. An example is here at the farm. When we moved here, there were areas where we found, I have literally tilled up mufflers out of the ground. Uh, we've run soils tests on some of those spots. In some of those spots, I have heavy levels of lead and arsenic and some other things. And I'm sure that they buried motor oil up near the old garage space. I just have smelled things as I'm digging and it used to be a common practice. So I just kind of assume in those spaces, but you should soils test for heavy metals if you're questioning whether that might be in your soil because that can work its way into your plants and then you can eat it, it's just not good. One place that we have that actually is alongside our driveway. So on either sides of our driveway, we actually plant sunflowers as phytoremediators. So they uptake a lot of that stuff out of the soil and they put it up and into the plant matter and then it helps pull it out of the soil. So it's a way to kind of help remediate and heal any soil that does have residual heavy metals in it. We've done that now for three years. I'm probably gonna do it one more year and then we'll retest and see what's happened there. Now, if you do do that, you have to discard of the plant matter because the studies are unclear on whether, you know, that stuff remains in the stems of the sunflowers, whether the lead is in those plants. So best practice right now is to just discard those and not compost them. So those are the times when I'd recommend getting a soils test. Now, do I think an annual soils test is needed? No, I think that's overkill for most of us. If we are practicing general regenerative practices like we talk about here on this channel. We're not using a lot of amendments. We're mostly relying on plants to fix and heal our soil and to build our soil. We're trying to avoid buying in a lot of bagged products. So 
we're not worrying as much about skewing the levels of our soil if we're practicing gardening this way. That being said, I do like to do a soil test every few years just so I can kind of see what the trends are and I love seeing the improvements that are made. Implementing a lot of these strategies, you're going to get improvements over time. So if you're someone who likes to see if my soil is doing great based on these things that I'm doing, then get a soils test every few years so that you can pat yourself on the back. <laughs> what kind of soils test should I get? So there are so many soils tests out there on the market. Uh, it can be very confusing. If you wanna go with the most basic one, I would recommend finding one that's close to you. So here in Colorado, we have Colorado State University Extension Service. They do soils tests. And the great thing about using CSU is they're very familiar with our soil type. So they know that we tend to have clay. Um, they kind of have some things that they tend to test for and keep an eye out for and recommend based on our region. I would never do a soils test from a company that sells fertilizers. I think to me, there's conflict of interest there. It, I'm not sure how I would feel about getting a soils test back from someone who's gonna turn around and say, here's the fertilizer that you now need to buy and we sell it. Uh, to me, I think there's a bit of a, like I said, conflict of interest there. But my favorite, favorite soils test to do is called the Haney test. And just for a little bit of background, back when we started doing soils tests, that process has really not changed from 80 years ago until now. Even though we have learned so much about soil health, things like microbes, things like fungi, we've changed in the last 80 years really how much we know about soil and it's changing every day. Still even probably tomorrow this video will be outdated. There are people in the regenerative space who are really considering that there needs to be a different way to test soils based on these regenerative practices, based on what we know about soil health. So a man named Rick Haney came up with a soils test that uses a different strategy. So basically they dry out the soil. This is gonna be a very rough overview. They try to replicate what would happen in the soil with rainfall, which is usually that microbial life kind of springs into action. There's respiration happening in the soil, but they dry out the soil and then they re-wet it. They measure the CO2 respiration of the soil. So what that number tells us is how much microbial activity is in the soil. Now there's other ways to measure that activity, of course, there's things like using microscopes. Uh, only the Haney soils test gives you a respiration level. All of the other soils tests just give you a general NPK based on this chemistry that they do and testing of your soil. So interestingly, what people who use in the agricultural space, people who are using this Haney soils test are finding that the recommendations for fertilizers and amendments is much lower based on the Haney test than it would be based on a conventional soils test. And that's because the Haney test is incorporating things like microbial life. We're gonna get into rhizophagy here in a second and talk about why microbial life is so important in your soil. But the Haney test considers that. It also looks at basically the groceries that are available in your soil for your plants to uptake later down the road. So while a conventional soils test only looks at really the chemistry NPK in your soil, the Haney test looks at what's the organic matter availability that's there for the microbes to convert and to mineralize and to turn into nutrients for your plants. Not just what's there, but what's the potential. So what a Haney test is going to give you as a recommendation is going to be a much lower rate of fertilizer and amendments than your average typical soils test. And then it's also gonna give you kind of that microbial information, that background on what is your soil respiration like. So I'm not gonna go into all of the details of the numbers that you'll get when you get a Haney soils test. That can get quite tedious. There's things like C to N ratios and uh, wet extractable organic carbon and wet extractable organic nitrogen and all of these things. So I'm not gonna get into all of that today, but if you do wanna get more into that, I'm gonna link below the lab that we use for our soils testing and they have a great document that you can review that will give you kind of ranges for your Haney test and they'll also give you an overall soil health score. So that's kind of nice because you can track that. It's gonna be really easy to track year over year if you're doing this test. So do I recommend soils testing? Yes, absolutely. I think that most of the time what it tells us is that we don't have to add as much stuff as we need uh, in our gardens, especially for doing this Haney soils test and especially for practicing regenerative things that we talk about here on this channel. Things like using cover crops, using plants to heal your soil instead of bagged and purchased amendments, things like making compost at home, growing your microbial life in your soil, protecting your soil, mulching your soil, not disturbing it. 
all of those things play into that regenerative idea. Okay, so now that we've been over soils testing, when to soils test, and soils testing, what kind of soils test I like to do, we're next gonna talk about rhizophagy because I wanna tie into the last piece of this why it's important that we are considering our microbial life as a key aspect of our soil health instead of just an NPK number. NPK is just a number. It does not measure the life within the soil, the bacteria, the microbes, the fungi, all of these cool things that really interplay. And so what I want to talk about briefly so that you kind of understand this is rhizophagy. Rhizophagy is a relatively new arrival on the soil health scene, and it's really cool. So back when tillage was invented it was by a man named Jethro Tull, and what he thought was that roots had these tiny mouths, and that in order for these tiny mouths to be able to eat the nutrients in the soil, uh, they had to grind up the soil and make it finer. So Jethro Tull believed that you could not make soil fine enough. The finer it was, the better. The more powdery it was, the better, because the plants could eat it better. Now, that wasn't quite right, but of course they didn't have all the science that we do now. So what we have learned recently is actually that there's this process called rhizophagy. So you might already know that microbes can help nutrients get into the plants and help convert organic matter into nutrients for the plants so that even if you might not necessarily have, say, nitrogen in your soil, if you have organic matter, those microbes can help break down that organic matter and turn it into nitrogen that your plants can uptake. What we just found out recently though is that there's actually this process called rhizophagy where the roots, and use that word with your friends because they'll be really impressed, and the rhizophagy is when the roots of the plants are actually absorbing bacteria from the soil and they're taking the nutrients that are existing within that bacteria. So say the bacteria was consuming some nitrogen in your soil, and then that bacteria gets absorbed by the roots of the plants. There's all these oxides, by the way, and things that are included in all of this process, but I'm not gonna get into it here because A, I'm not an expert in it, and B, I don't wanna bore you. But what's happening is, when the plant absorbs that bacteria, so that bacteria gets up next to the root of the plant, the root of the plant actually absorbs that bacteria into its root, and in doing so, it absorbs all the nutrients within that bacteria as well. So by absorbing those bacteria and those microbes, it's actually taking in all of the nutrients that were existing within those microbes. And then the other thing that they're finding is that once the plant has taken in those nutrients from that bacteria, it spits it, the empty bacteria back out into the soil through root hairs, and that process actually helps extend the root hairs of the plants, making them more better able to get more nutrients and more microbes and more bacteria absorbed through their roots. And so, and then that bacteria that it spit out through the root hairs then reabsorbs more nutrients, more minerals, and then cycles back into the plant. So there's this constant cycling happening. So we've always known kind of that roots secrete this exudate, these kind of sugars that attract microbes and things, and that that helps create the rhizosphere of the plant, the area around the root area, and by having healthy microbes and soil activity in that root area, we knew that that helped plants uptake nutrients. But recently we've discovered this rhizophagy process, and by we, I mean scientists, okay? I did not discover this, although I've looked at it with my microscope, which is really cool. So this is why it's so important that we think about microbial life before we ever consider nutrients, okay? Because what can happen if all we're thinking about is what kind of bag do I need to buy at the garden center to fix my soil, we're ignoring the major way that most plants uptake nutrients and we can actually even be impacting them negatively. So for example, phosphorus, right? It's been proven, it's been studied and scientifically proven that excess phosphorus in the soil leads to the death of fungi. So mycorrhizal fungi are going to be much, much lower in population in soils where phosphorus levels are high. This is something that we talk about a lot here because compost, if you'll remember from our Garden Gold video where we talked about compost, and I'll link that one down below, a lot of composts have excess phosphorus. So we might think that we're doing a really good thing by applying a lot of compost to our gardens, but what we're actually doing is overloading our gardens with phosphorus and therefore killing a lot of the mycorrhizal fungi and the soil life that we need to help our plants 
intake the nutrients that are existing within our soil. And over amending using fertilizers in general kind of makes our plants lazy. So there's also been this research that shows that when plants are getting fertilizers from an outside source, so I'll use big ag as an example of this because I'm very familiar with it with our family farm. They use hog manure, but they also use chemical nitrogen. And so applying chemical nitrogen to a plant, yes, it will help, it will green up the plant, but what it does is it makes the plant lazy. The plant doesn't put out the root exudates that attract the bacteria to its rhizosphere. So once that plant starts getting those nutrients without having to put out the root exudates to attract the bacteria, that cycle stops. So if we are externally amending our plants and trying to feed our plants and trying to put nutrients into our soil, we can actually be undoing a lot of the important work that the soil life is trying to do for us. This is why I emphasize using the Haney Soils Test because it's going to measure the microbial life. It's going to measure things like what is available in the pantry for these microbes to use and to turn into nutrients for your plants. Um, so you can kind of see how that falls in within this regenerative gardening standpoint. So, I hope that answered some of your questions. It probably created more questions than it answered for a lot of you, but hopefully it stimulated a little bit of excitement about soil and wanting to learn more about it. And we'll be talking more about this here in the coming weeks on the channel, I Love Soil Health. And again, this is a huge topic in our upcoming book. So make sure you're staying tuned uh, for all of those good things. And yeah, I've got something to do. Oh, I'm gonna plant my willows. I know I've been promising my willow hedge video for some time now. We finally just got all the soil moved away from the fence so that I can finish planting them. So that willow video will be coming up here this weekend. So stay tuned if you wanna learn how to plant a living willow hedge. And we'll see you guys around here soon at the farm. I hope you're all enjoying spring. Talk to you later.